Welcome back to another episode of Nothing to Do. I am your host, Jeremy, and Thanksgiving weekend is officially over. It was a good Thanksgiving weekend. You know what I noticed about, um, you know, it's a time when family, you know, friends get together, and then a lot of friends from abroad, they usually get to see them. This is that time of year where they're, they're back home, right? So you're seeing a lot of old friends from high school, uh, middle school even. You see a lot of friends that maybe you played ball with back in the day or whatever it may be. Yo, I don't know about y'all, but I noticed one thing this year. Uh, white people do not say happy Thanksgiving anymore. Uh, <laughs> I find that shit hilarious. I caught up with a lot of, um, in a good weekend, a couple of days, I caught up with a lot of old friends from high school. Some that I see, you know, more often than others, and 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 some that you know I only see maybe once every couple of years. But it's funny, yo, because usually around this time of year, you go in and you see people, and you're like, "Oh, what's going on? Happy holiday, you know, Happy Thanksgiving, good to see you." I know, yo, know, I don't think one of, I think matter of fact, I think only one of my friends that I've seen that I haven't that I have reunited with in the past, whatever actually said happy thanksgiving um yeah i mean like the we all know the, the history of thanksgiving which i i would assume has a lot to do with it but hey listen i personally i don't care i <laughs> like i say happy thanksgiving obviously thanksgiving um has taken on um we all know the history of thanksgiving but it's taken on a different meaning throughout the years and no one says happy thanksgiving anymore you know directly referring to the origins of Thanksgiving. I say it because, um, you know, I've been saying it all my life, but I just, I just, it was an observation. Of, it was my observation of the weekend folks, which I thought was very funny. Um, none of my white friends said happy Thanksgiving, be it white guilt, be it wokeness, what have you. Um, I thought that was fucking hilarious. I don't know. That shit made me just thinking about it at my crib the other day. I was kind of, kind of snickered to myself a little bit. Um, before I continue and before I forget, I want to say R.I.P. to Virgil Abloh. That shit was wild. I found out about that yesterday. I was at work. And, um, yeah, that was another one sort of like the Chadwick, Chadwick Boseman one, R.I.P. Definitely didn't hit me as hard as Chadwick Boseman. Chadwick Boseman was obviously the Black Panther. I love that movie. I love a lot of his work and what he stood for and et cetera. Um, so that one was tough. But, yeah, this one was like that in the sense that, you know, no one... Do, knew what that Virgil was dealing with this cancer for the last two, three years, whatever it was. And unfortunately, um, you know, it took his life yesterday. He was a, such a big influence, um, not only in fashion, but just like even in music as well. I know he's not known for his music, but he, he DJs a lot. And, um, but yeah, he was a fashion icon. He was a visionary. He was in a lot of ways, the face of Louis Vuitton with this off-white brand and what he meant to the culture is, um, will forever be cemented uh, in this generation and generations to come. So, R.I.P. Virgil. Um, I, you know, I personally never, I, I liked a lot of the off-white sneakers um, and off-white brand stuff. I never, actually, I don't think I've ever owned anything off-white, but his shit was fly. And he ha- he made his impact, and you know, unfortunately, this is a situation where I'm giving this man his flowers after the fact. But I guess better than nothing, right? So, yeah, and um, you know, where do I transition from here? What else did the holiday the holiday bring me? The holiday brought us a nice W, another nice fucking W for my New England Patriots who are now 8 and four, first place in the AFC, looking like one of the top five, dare I say, top three teams in the AFC, heading into week uh, nine or heading into our bye week two. I think it's going to be week, not week nine, I'm, what am I saying? We have eight wins. Week 13 or week 14 or 15? Jesus Christ, let me get it together. But um, yeah, yeah, we're looking solid. And I also wasn't able to watch last night's game or yesterday's game because I was at work. Well, it was a big win against the Titans, who were eight and three, I believe, or eight and four going into the game. Now they're eight and five. Um, in the NFL, there's not really up until about two weeks ago. The only team that was really standing out was the Rams, and they haven't even gotten a dub since they signed OBJ. Um, which is bittersweet on my end because I like OBJ. 
It, well, it's not that I care for the Rams. I like OBJ and I want to see him win. And uh, it seems like he's some, he's got this fuku hanging over him <laughs> that um, doesn't seem to go away. First two games in LA, but you know we still got there's still season left. And obviously, outside of me wanting to see the Patriots win, I would love to see um, OBJ at least do something in the playoffs, which would be really cool because I I think he's a dope player. Again, I'm keeping it short and sweet here, guys. I'm I'm here again by myself, and I'm kind of practicing. I guess this is sort of practice in a ways, too, for me being on the mic by myself. I talked about it before, how much harder it was, not only to record at home, but now, like, recording by yourself, it's a lot harder than 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 I thought it would be. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm starting to get back into the swing of things. I don't know if you guys know. I mean, we, we've talked about this on the episode of Remel. We've talked about this on the show before. Um, so, Ghislaine Maxwell's trial is coming up. And I want to talk about this specific player in her trial. Quick refresh on who Ghislaine Maxwell is. She's tied up in the whole Jeffrey Epstein uh, sex trafficking of minors and all that stuff. And she's getting prosecuted and tried on her involvement with everything. And the trial is... is just about ready to beginning. And she is calling this psychologist, this OG Karen. Her name is Elizabeth Loftus, and she's a practicing psychologist. She's actually pretty well-renowned in her work. And her field of work is, or her, her specialization when it comes to psychology specifically, is false memory she's considered a false memory expert and she like and she talks about how memories can change over time and just by what people tell you and that through false memories and time and hearing things that people are able to to tell a story or recount their of uh, you know address the re- the account of whatever event it they may be that they are addressing and they can say with confidence because of the way that works. I'm not going to get into the science about it. I didn't read too much about that. But this queen of gaslighting is is known for, this is not her, she's coming to help the defense in this being, in, in this case being Glenn Maxwell. And basically is going to take gaslighting to a new level by <laughs> being like, by, attributing that to, I mean, I don't know exact, obviously the, the case isn't played out. I don't exactly know how her study in, in false memories is going to play out within the trial, but I would imagine it has something to do with like, yeah, I think you're remembering all the events from Epstein Island uh, a little bit differently, which I understand the fact. I don't think it's, it's necessarily like a new way of thinking or this groundbreaking study or finding that, memories get distorted and little they kind of fade and maybe change a little bit over time like over a, a large amount of time but i would attribute that more to like maybe the events that happened at some party i was at when i was in boston or you know maybe something something may something someone may have said you know while i was bowling with them or something that happened you know at a bowling you know i went bowling with some friends or out with some drinks whatever it may be but to attribute false memories to a fucking sexual trafficking and basically a rape case about a bunch of billionaires, you know, having these crazy ass parties with underage uh, children as, you know, sexual objects. Bro, that's fuck that. I, I can't even imagine one how you would go about framing that argument to something so traumatic. But then, like, just like how the, like, just as the victims of of Jeff of Epstein Island, like it's just like yo, what the fuck do you like? What <laughs> like yo? This is like me. T- this is like the most uh, final boss of the counter like Me Too movement ever. Like this is some wild shit. And she's also testified. This lady, fucking um, King Karen over here. Her name is Elizabeth Loftus. She has also testified uh, in Harvey Weinstein's defense and Robert Durst's defense. I know we all know, you know, Harvey Weinstein. That one was pretty popular in the last 
10 years. Uh, Robert Durst, I don't know too much about him. He was like this crazy real estate mogul who, I think they finally convicted him, but he like murdered his wife or some shit back in the days from New York. He tested, she testified for that. And like, she has a history of like in these high profile cases dealing with like billionaires um, and like defending them. And it's like, it's kind of fucked up. And like, it's first of all, it's fucked up to gaslight on such a crazy level when it comes to such traumatic experiences. But then as a then you gotta take it back and you're just like on a personal level on who you are as a person, on your quality of character and judgment and morals. It's just like how do you like that check may must be cutting I mean, I don't know, do you cut a check for like obviously maybe it's on or off the books. We're dealing with million millionaires here, right? But it's like, yo, like, how do you, like, how do you look yourself in the mirror in the morning and go to sleep at night, knowing you are going in to testify and help defend sexual trafficking billionaires, um, and that you have a history of this before, and it's, it's kind of like, like you, it's, I don't think it's, it's, it's hard to take yourself out of your own, like, per, like, or whatever you're more like, I don't think you can, it's impossible to not take yourself out of yourself or yourself out of your profession and just have this, this be such an objective like defense. Like, uh, it's, I don't know. Yeah. That's pretty fucking wild. And kind of staying on the, <laughs> on the topic of, of sort of like borderline, I wouldn't say it. I guess. I guess this is sort of like authority. Uh, the uh, an authority. Uh, <laughs> I can't, give me a second. I'm, uh, bear with me, y'all. Authoritative sort of behavior. Like this is how it comes out in the U.S. Sort of like very nuanced. Like just throwing money at a situation in in such a way that it's just like, what the fuck are we supposed to do? Um, I mean, it's not saying that she's going to get acquitted or not, but it's just like, then on the other side, there's China. I don't know if you guys heard about what's going, I mean, what happened with this, te- this former tennis star, her name is Peng Shui. She went missing for like three weeks because she went on like Chinese social media. I think it's called like Weibo or what? I don't even know. And she said that she was, she, she was sexually assaulted by the former member of like the standing committee of the, of the communist party. His name is Zhang Gaoli. He's like 75 years old. And she went on social media and China, yo, China does not, they don't play that shit. They don't play any type of shit. Like they are on some like crazy authoritarian, authoritarian, author, that's not a word I'm going to get down on this episode. So I'm sorry, (laughs) y'all. But, um, yeah, she went missing for like three weeks and China don't, they, they, uh, they never, they're not about any type of, you know, uh, any type of anti-government, anti, you know, establishment thing, let alone fucking going straight me too on a former member of the Communist Party, of the Standing Committee of the Communist Party. But yeah, she went missing for like three weeks. She, she turned up recently at um some fucking tennis tournament in Beijing. She said she was fine and like she went to dinner with, I think like the inter... And she went to dinner with like the International Olympic... um committee committee i think and they said that she oh she seemed fine and she seemed relaxed at the dinner but then like the wta is coming out and saying yeah i don't i don't fully buy it and yo i don't i don't fully buy it either because she's 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 fine like nothing happened and you know obviously like <laughs> like that's it's pretty wild like you, you're gone for three weeks you come back nothing's fine after making some ball like yo you gotta have some balls on you this is peng shui Yo, she's a champion too. I think she peaked singles like at fourteen overall. I think she's a she's a women's uh she's a Wimbledon champion on the double side of things. Like she was she was about it. She's retired now. I think she's like thirty five. Um, but yeah, she she's got some balls on her because China has a history of doing shit like this. First of all, China. I remember um hearing this on the New York Times uh, a couple of years ago, just like a whole special they did on like just surveillance in, in China and how there's cameras every cameras literally everywhere. And there's a lot of, there's history of people speaking out against the government um, who have gone missing, you know, for three, for weeks, sometimes months, come back 
and don't answer any questions at all as to what happened, what what may have happened to them within that time they went missing, who reached out to them, yada, yada, yada. But it's just like for you, like for you to be like to go missing for three weeks and then come back and be on some like, yeah, everything's fine. Like, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, oh, okay. Yeah, uh, okay. Like, what really happened? And, like, the WTA actually still is pushing for for her, for them to get more information, which it won't happen. Obviously, like, no one really believes that she was fine. And, like, she's obviously, there's a lot of people that still believe, and the WTA included, the WTA being the Women's Tennis Association, uh, that she's obviously being coerced into saying what she's saying and that, you know, she there's no way that she's going to be able to give a real account of what happened. But it goes to show you, you know, it's, it, it is wild to think about in a sense that, like, especially how, uh, you know, how connected the world is and how fast information travels uh, in, in the year 2021 and how we have access to all types of information and, and sort of evidence and footage and what it, what have you. For this to, like, go on, like, you know, where a government is clearly meddling in a situation, you know, doing some shady-ass shit, uh, like, that sort of, it's almost like medieval, like, the way China, like, the way that's going, the way that went down in China, the way things like that go down in China, where that type of suppression is a lot more nuanced in in countries like the U.S. or maybe, you know, England, U.K., like, these other first world countries, but, like, in China, like, they're really up front with it. Like, yo, like, they on some other shit, which is kind of wild to think about. And, um, and yeah, China, China, that's just a wild place. It's one of those stories, too, though, because it's just, like, you can, you can only take what you read. Even now, like, you can only take what you read on the news or, you know, what you look up with a grain of salt, no matter... Especially after the last four years uh, of Trump and and the way the media and, and journalism has been manipulated in the way it's, it's kind of like the age of spin sort of kind of fucked everything up when it comes to credibility. But, um, you know, it's times like these where I feel like I, I, I wish I was uh, a little bit more uh, of a, an international man at my time at Bentley. I know there was a lot of Chinese students there. I almost joined the international club there too, but... Just saying that, like, maybe, you know, I would love to speak with somebody that comes from China. Like, it's always better to speak to people that come from these countries where at least, you know, where crazy shit is going on and hear what, like, hear what's actually going on in the streets out there and, like, what's actually going on out there from, like, from people that are out there. Like, that was one thing, you know, I'll go back to my, from my trip in Cuba, like, you know, we have our own conception of Cuba here in the U.S., um, but a lot of things are totally different there. And, like, I asked a lot of questions about, like, sort of, you know, I, I made some friends out there, and I, I remember having a conversation it's about life there and, like, stuff about Fidel Castro and, like, you know, generational ways of thinking and the transition of, like, of, of, of the embargo there and, you know, how... You know, certain, you know, the embargo did fuck up the country in a lot of ways, but, you know, there's a lot, but there's also, like, a level of accountability that uh, certain people don't hold themselves to out there. And this is just, co- this is, and this is, again, this is coming from other, you know, from from people I met out there in Havana. Um, so it's always interesting to get those, it's always interesting, and it's always important to remember that you need those kind of perspectives. Um when it comes to talking about like international news or whatever may be going on in the world, because everything, especially here in the U.S., everything can get spun in so many different ways. And um, and yeah, so like yeah, so when I read up on this like on this Peng Shui, in you know, ordeal that that went on in China, it's just like I I, I wonder what what day to day life is like in China, and it's just like is it really like that, like on top, like yeah, so. But yeah, that's some some shit, some some interesting news topics. It's funny, I don't even have good news for the week. So the way I would go about finding good news for the week is usually through Reddit, unless it's like something that I know that's happening, maybe that's happening locally or something that's like in the news that's like pretty spot on. Like I'll go on Reddit and I'll go on their news page and I'll just scroll headlines and literally the headlines. Like, yo, I'll do this right now real quick before I move on to the next segment, but... 
I go to Reddit news. I go on it every day, and this is um, these are the the headlines that I read. For top one. I'll read you the first. I'll read you the first couple. Just to get the gist. So it's, it's literally just like Arizona students seek Kyle Rittenhouse removal from online nursing classes. Uh, 21, 21 year old Kansas state lawmaker suspected of DUI weeks after domestic violence arrest. So it's literally just like it's it's pages and pages. And I was scrolling for like almost half. I was just scrolling, scrolling. Like I was like. Yo, I really can't find anything that I would feel could make my good news of the week. So that segment is getting skipped for today. But we are going back to the segment that I brought last week. Something that I, I, I hope to bring on to weeks and for weeks to come and months to come and years to come on the NTD podcast is read yourself to death. And we are going to stick again this week. Uh, with um, a topic of DR. More specifically, we are going to talk about um, a superhero, if you will, a superhero, almost a metaphysical fucking being in that of Olivorio Mateo, a.k.a. Papa Livorio, uh, and the birth of Livorismo. Um, And this guy was a fucking badass. And he came... Um, you know, he he came to light, you know, he became famous uh, sort of in the late 19th century, early 20th century. Uh, so, like, that's like late 1870s, 80s, and then, like, the early 1900s. Um, and this dude was just, he was a healer. He was like, he was like fucking Gandalf and Fred Hampton and, like, Jackie Moon rolled all into one. This guy was like, a spiritual being. And before I go into deep in, into more detail about, you know, who he was and what he did, um, I'll kind of set the scene of what DR was like in the mid 1870s that kind of led um to the rise of Olivia Mateo and, and and to for him to do what he did. And um it's funny cuz the 1870s was like it was post restoration war which I probably will talk about uh in a future episode. Uh, at the rest Dominican Restoration War, which I personally believe is the real DR Independence Day, but that's for another day. Um, that was like the time where like the the Industrial Revolution was kind of uh, making its way, so slowly creeping towards DR, um, and it's specifically, so the country was kind of moving to like the sugar plantation or sugar like sugar cane and plantations across the country, but like straight like you know new age shit. And so a lot of American and Cuban capitalists and like they were coming to DR and they were investing a lot of money in this stuff and they were backed by like the Dominican elites, which was like the Dominican Creoles and the Criollos and shit like that. You know, the Dominicans that like were heavily rooted, uh, are heavily rooted in Spain. And um, the shift in economy brought obviously a lot of industrialization to DR, but it had a big effect culturally and socially and sort of the borderlands, but more specifically, like the San Juan Valley uh, in DR, which like borders Haiti. And it was like it's so that you know those borderlands, especially the the San Juan Valley, has always been like sort of a hot zone for just like political and social discussion and discourse throughout DR, where you know that's where a lot of the Afro, you know, and Dominican Haitian. Uh, population is and a lot of the hateros the cattle ranchers and that's how the economy was um was moving back in those days it was just and it was so like it was so geographically isolated that the rest of of dr like what was going on economically and politically um they were basically isolated from that because they were so geographically isolated that they they kind of fought for themselves over the in the borderland this is my understanding and it's funny because a lot of the economy throughout that time was a lot of trading in agriculture and going and like through Haiti. So there was a lot of collaboration um, and communication with Haiti within the economy and everything was untaxed. So they, they, they had like their own little system going, going to and from Haiti and the, the actual Dominican state wasn't getting a taste of this. And the border was very fluid because of that. And so it's just like not and like so ethnically and culturally it's, it was very diverse because of of the collaboration between DR and Haiti in that part and the flow between DR and Haiti in that part of the country. And the thing is though, that like 
the rich Dominicans, the white Dominicans, like they they saw like those borderlands of like as the weakness of Dominicanidad. Like that was like the one like the 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 underlying issue that they needed to take care of. It was like you know like Hitler had the Jews, and like DR had like you know that the the Afro population, the Dominican Haitian population. Like what the fuck are we gonna do with these? fucking people they do they fucking they're campesinos and they practice voodoo and 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 their skin is dark and their hair is nappy and like so like that was sort of moving forward and like what the dominican state wanted to address and like how they were going to deal with the shit that was going on in the borderlands and unfortunately you know like the americans came through the rich people came through and they start setting up, um, you know, sugar plantation, like crazy sugar plantations and factories and what have you and processing plants um, in the San Juan Valley and all that stuff. And like, you know, and in that time there was no, pri- like they didn't really believe in that capitalist, like privatization of the land. Like the land was communal and it was a big part of the economy. Like it was more of, of like a favor to favor exchange as opposed to like favor, you know, like a, a monetary exchange. And, you know, through the, basically, like, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, motherfuckers came through, they privatized those, they bought those lands, they privatized them, made stricter borders, um, and they basically criminalized, like, those Afro-religious practices. And in 1908, here comes Olivorio Mateo, bro, and he was, you know, he used to work for those, um, for the owners of the, the the sugar processing plants and the sugar plantations, and he would build, he would fence them off, and he would defend them. And in 1908 came, it was like the great storm of 1908. It was this fucking crazy hurricane that came and ravaged like the southeast coast of the of the U.S. and like the West Indies. It it, it um it lasted for like a week. And Olivoria went in, basically, that dude went into, like, the mouth of the storm in the San Juan Valley and disappeared. And, you know, everybody presumed him to be dead. And he came back nine days later. You know, they had, like, a week-long memorial service for him. And he came back on the ninth day of the, uh, and ninth and final day, might I add, of the memorial service. And return like fucking Jesus Christ himself. And he says that he was taken to heaven by an angel on a white horse. And God recruited him to be his servant, to spread his word, and like to cure illness. And save the world, basically. Like this motherfucker was going to be like the next, I don't know, fucking Black Panther some shit. This nigga was a boss. And like, I, and I, I understand like, Already setting up the story, just like the way he comes back, is just like such a setup for like a con man. But like this dude was a, a legit healer, like, and he he believed in the voodoo practices, the voodoo practices. Uh, you know, of you know, he wasn't into like the mo- the Western medicine, the modern medicine. You know, he healed through herbs and prayers and spiritual dances and and what have you. I mean, I I, I don't. I haven't studied too much on the voodoo culture and the in religious practice specifically, but that's how he went about healing people. And he actually established uh, his own camp. It was like a city. It was called Ciudad Santa in the San Juan Valley, and it was based on those ideals that would basically were in direct conflict with like this Dominican modernization process and this Dominican modernization eras, where you know they were looking to privatize land and 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 boost industry and 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 do all of that, you know, Ciudad Santa was based on, you know, any, you know, communal lands. And anybody with, like, anyone regardless of, like, background or race or ethnicity or class, like, they were allowed there, and he healed them there. And one thing that's very important to know is that he healed for free. They said, el curaba pero no cobraba. He became a fucking messiah in these people. And, like, within, like, weeks, for like, I think it was, like, the first year when he came back, it was, like, 1909. Like, they had, like... He had like two thousand over two thousand people a week coming to his camp, and like from everywhere, not just like the the western part of the DR, but like they were coming from fucking Santiago and Higüey, and they're coming from fucking everywhere. And it wasn't, I think it was in, it was in, like he that he like he, what he stood for, basically became a direct threat to like 
this new modernist way of thinking, this Dominican modernism, a.k.a. like colonialism. And in 1909, I think, is when he really started to like gain notor- notoriety among like the Criollos and like Dominican white people. And he was actually like he was accused by like prominent like doctors in in that studied like modern medicine that he was like practicing illegal medicine, and the journalists like would demonize him, um in in the papers at Gava they would talk about like like they were heathens and vagrants and miscreants and they had these crazy sexual or like they just they just shit on him on on, on the Liberista movement. But not only, but the, the, the thing that's important to know here is that not only was he like a threat morally and socially and culturally, but like he possessed like power and like he put fear in them for like a real rebellion because the Liberistas, they, they had firearms like they were they were they were strapped because they, they fought and served in the Civil War of 1912. And I don't know too much about that war, but I knew they served, which means they were strapped. And I'll probably get into that in another episode. And then in 1916, when the U.S. finally invaded and they started their occupation in DR, um, they the Liberistas helped the Haitians fight the U.S. across the border. And they ended up having to, um, by the second year of like the U.S. occupation, so like by 1918, like the U.S., like they had to surrender their arms to the U.S. And like it, it was fucking wild. And like, you know, but, you know, he stood strong. Liboria stood strong, the Liborista stood strong, and, you know, what's wild is that even, like, there like there was still a lot of tensions, and even though he surrendered his arms and the Liborista surrendered their arms, like, the like the, the, the white Dominicans, that's what we call them, the white Dominicans, <laughs> they would still, like, they would fabricate lies to the U.S., uh, like, the U.S. soldiers that were occupying, saying, like, there was incoming tax, and that, like, led to battles where, like, there was even a crazy battle I think it's San Juan. I want to say I want to say San Juan. I don't know. Um, but he lost like Liboria lost nine of his good men, and like he had to kind of small make his circle a little smaller because that's what the thing was. So that was like the kind of the negative that came from Ciudad Santa being so open to everybody. Like it was open to spies and rich people, kind of see was going what was going on and keep to basically keep an eye on them for the next three to five years. Y'all like Liborio, he still. His his ciudad santa was mobile. They would move camp to camp, and they would heal people and bring hope, and and they would plant gardens um in the mountains, like secretly in the mountains, for like almost like a communal like a communal garden to feed his people, and um and even like still like smuggling goods like to and from Haiti, like they were doing. They were on some like straight guerrilla shit, and for like the next three to five years, uh, and unfortunately though. Liboria was killed uh, in 1922 They because the, the Americans were after him for, like, a while. Uh, and they killed him brutally. They, like, gunned him down, like, just fucking lit him up, riddled him with bullets, and then hung him up, uh, I think, in the San Juan Valley Square. And in in, I think it was in, in San Juan, just to kind of as a message. Uh, because even though, like, the U.S. themselves didn't see, like, they didn't see the Liboristas as, as anything more than, like, just... Uh, a gang of like bandits and miscreants, but like they held a lot more power, just like culturally, more than anything. Um, than the U.S. made them out to be, and that's why, like the Dominicans that were opposed, they the white Dominicans were kind of so on their ass. Uh, but what was wild is that even his death, though, like it even solidified his status as a messiah, like to his followers, and and. You know, his execution was meant to, like, deter further, I guess, quote-unquote, uprisings or any new messiahs coming from the Liborista movement, any new healers. Um, But, yeah, this dude was, like, this dude was a straight-up, like I said, (laughs) to start the segment. Like, he was fucking, like, Gandalf and and Jesus and Fred Hampton and, like, Jackie Moon all rolled into one, bro. Like, he, he went and he met God for nine days. He met God for nine days and was, like, God was, like, yo, you're my son. You're my servant now, and this is what I need you to do. And he did that shit, and he did that shit despite everything going on in the DR, despite you know the persecution of you know the Afro Dominican community and the Dominican Asian community. Um, and yeah, so I mean, unfortunately, like Trujillo came not too long after. There were some people that kind of succeeded him, 
and and helped and, and kept the movement going. But like Trujillo kind of put it into that shit real quick. And um, and yeah, so I hope you enjoyed and learned something new on this week's Read Yourself to Death. Uh, Papa Liborio was a fucking freedom fighter in a lot of ways and a healer and a messiah uh, to to the you know to the Afro Latino culture and the Afro Dominican culture in the borderlands and obviously his his reach and his influence stretched way beyond just the borderlands but all of DR as people from all over DR were coming and seeking his his um his healing abilities and he did it for free right. El curaba, pero no cobraba. Let's remember that. Um, so, yeah, if you're listening to this and this is something new that you're learning, I'm glad you're learning something new. If you're listening to this and you know all about the Liborista movement and are like, Jeremy, you're a fucking idiot and you're missing all this stuff and he was actually this and not that, please reach out. I would love to have a conversation and just tell me that I'm stupid because <laughs> I'm learning this as I go, y'all. But, like, I'm having fun learning a lot of all this all, uh, learning all this shit. Um, and yeah, I gotta, I gotta, you know what I gotta work on? I have to work on talk. I think I have to talk a little slower. That's why I keep tripping over my words. I, I think I'm going too fast because I'm by myself recording this. Who knows? But, um, yeah, I feel like I'm talking too fast. Maybe I, I, I need to slow it down. Um, so, since I didn't say there was any, I guess this kind of also rolls into good news, but this isn't anything new. I think this started in February of this year. Um, but I want to give a shout out to the Providence Community Fridge. It's a good time. I honestly wish I shouted this out last week, given that it was leading up to Thanksgiving and it was a perfect time uh, to bring awareness to this stuff. But, um, the, yeah, I want to shout out the Providence Community Fridges. Um I know Ren Free PVD. It's an, a nonprofit uh, here in uh, in Rhode Island, led by Dana Hang. I'm just reading this on uh, RI Monthly, but there's one on 705 w- Westminster Street in Providence, and there's one in on 640 Broad Street in Providence. That one's led by Sarah Federici. Uh, but yeah, these are they're just community fridges where you can go in and uh, and stock food, and there the the goal is to to feed families of lower income, a lot of food insecure families, especially it's a great time to do this, uh, given that it's the holiday season and you know, it's a, it's a, a season where we basically feast, you know, Thanksgiving and then Christmas and new years and a lot of family get togethers and, um, it's a good way, uh, to help lower income families and a food insecure families uh, have something to eat during this holiday season because at the very least, like, you know, a lot of us are, you know, not doing as well as others during the holiday season and, and you know, eating and having access to food is, like, such a fucking uh, blessing during these times. And, and so, yeah, you can visit the one on 600 and 640 Broad Street in Providence and one on 705 uh, Westminster Street in Providence doing some big things, some some great things out there, uh, feeding the needy. And it's funny, I've I've uh, read and um about community fridges in the past, and in practice or in theory or you know, in premise, it's such a great idea, right? You know, you have a, you can go in, stock the stock the fridge with produce and and good canned goods and just a lot of stuff to feed. Just feed these low, uh, you know, low income families. But then the skeptical, more uh, side of me wants to know how these really work in practice, <laughs> and um, how much actual, you know, home. I know the the homeless people are probably encouraged to take from it. I think I know they're usually more geared towards uh, lower income families and like food insecure families. But I also have, you know, have family members that are in the, uh, you know, in the Providence Fire Department. And they deal with a lot of homeless people on an everyday basis. And I wonder if they have any stories revolving around community fridges. Because that would be very interesting. Because I just, again, like, it, on, the concept of a community fridge is is great. But I could see it in practice going very south. Um, so I'm, I'm giving my shout out to the, shout out with the grain of salt. You know, with the little, uh, uh, with the little, 
contrary or you know, a skeptical opinion of how it could actually be implemented in practice. But I think it's a dope thing. So if you have a time, again, it's uh, 640 Broad Street and then 705 Westminster. Um, you know, drop a can of beans off. You know, drop some tomatoes off some shit. I don't know. Help a nigga eat today. And, um, and yeah, that's the episode for today. I hope you enjoyed that. Again, hope we're going to have a guest you know, second mic on this up and running real soon. But in the meantime, you guys are stuck with me, you dirtbags. So until next time, holla.